Greetings and welcome to the Badger Caves West Wing, where our stealthy polecats ferret out the best feels, funnies, and what the fucks to discuss slam bam badger style. Your sinuous hosts for the evening are myself, Supreme Doge in charge, Brian, our polecat punster, Hannah, Dr. Randomer Cam, Panda at large, Mr. Yellow Skinned Simpsons Kid himself, Max Derrett, and our anchorilla, Scott. How about Yellow Bastard? We go with that for Mark. That uh, Yellow for, uh, Bastard? Max. No. Yeah, that Yellow Bastard. Oh, come <laughs> on. It's got a nice ring to it. I, I bet you remember my voice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> See, you love it. See, you laugh yeah. at it. It makes you feel good, Actually, doesn't it? better be good. It better be perfect. We've kind of got all the colors of the Power Rangers here, if Hannah counts as the black one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. This black evening, and white. Yeah. Scott's just afraid that he might t- like the taste of Simpsons dick. But anyways, go ahead. Oh, yeah, it's like mustard. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I hate mustard. <laughs> you like my mustard? Uh, anyone? No. If it was like lemon meringue, I'd be okay with it, though. Oh. Just tell me it's like so lemon if they, meringue. If, if, okay. get stick, if they get sick, does that turn spicy brown? Yes. Uh, it's scurvy. Oh, uh, <laughs> gross. Scott wants some Grey Poupon. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. I gotta get to the. I gotta get to the rest of this. All right. So, this evening we'll be covering the following topics: why stunt women might be in more danger than stunt men, despite doing less dangerous stunts. Mass Effect designer hates white people. Rugby star accused of rape because he had to leave early for practice the next morning. Rich wives told to get a job by judges. And finally, our bonus story for the patron-only after show. Girls in gaming take on bro culture. Girls, girls, girls. We all know bros hate girls, but girls are fighting back by taking over bros games. It's a continuation of the media's fake war of the sexes, because some people just don't leave that shit behind in kindergarten. Anyway, if you want to listen to this topic or enjoy further personalized discussion with the Badgers on select topics, become a patron. www.patreon.com forward slash honeybadgerradio. Now, here is our anchorilla Scott and such news, mini story, Doge with the news. Oh uh, my. Before we get started, I have to make a brief announcement. Uh, the documentary by Cassie J, known as The Red Pill, has a, an unofficial uh, sort of premiere date. According to Aaron Pitsy, the very first showing ever will be on October 7th. If you're interested in checking it out, it could be the day that it's released and it could be a premiere. I don't have a lot of details. But I do know that, according to Erin Pitsy, she will be seeing it on October 7th. So that means the film is still a reality, it's still coming, and it appears to be right around the corner when you think about it, because we're like almost halfway through August already, and uh, before you know it's going to be fall, holy shit. Um, but yeah, October 7th, Red Pill, the Red Pill documentary. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Now, Scott. Who's ah? Uh, let's see. The movie Critics vs. John Q. Public. Uh, with the release of Warner Brothers' newest film in the DCCU, Suicide Squad, we once again find ourselves in a situation where the movie watchers and the movie critics are very divided. Uh, this trend has <clears throat> excuse me, pardon me. Um, this trend has existed for a long, for as long as there have been critics, but recently the internet has grown much louder. With the reviews for Suicide Squad, or when the God, I cannot speak tonight. Excuse me. All right, it's all right. I should pre-record this. Um, when the reviews for Suicide Squad came out, it appeared the film would be poor. At present, it's sitting at 26%, while viewers gave it a score of 72%. There was such a rage at the re- at reviewers that a petition to shut down Rotten Tomatoes, even even though it was partially owned by Warner Brothers and RT, is nothing more than a site that comp- compiles reviews and has no bearing on what the results would be. But with all controversy surrounding these differences of opinion on the part of the reviewers and consumers is the response from YouTube personalities. Popular YouTube reviewers like Schmoes No, What the Flick, John Campea, Channel Awesome, Chris Stuckman, and Mark Kermode have have insulted and criticized directors, writers, producers, devs, and their listeners. But when they are criticized, they become victims of online abuse and get teary-eyed on videos while announcing from their ivory towers that there is a problem with fandoms or something of the like. Fandoms can get messy for sure, but I propose this. Do we really need critics to validate our taste? Do we need critics? Okay. Uh, 
do you want to do you have any thoughts about that? Oh, Hannah looks like Hannah has a question. I just have one question. So, uh, let me see it. My, my question is whether or not I have this straight. Movie critics are allowed to not like what the people that that they criticize have done. They're not allowed to like those people's work. But movie critic fans are not allowed to not like their work. They're so so one's allowed and the other's not. Is that what I'm getting from this? Do as I say, not as I do, Hannah. Okay, just wanted to make sure I had that straight. That's it. That's my entire <laughs> comment you know on the entire place, thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, this is this is kind of ridiculous. That's that's. I mean, before we get in any protracted discussions about this, I think this is this is the the epitome of irony. Mm -hmm. The this is the epitome of do what I say, uh, do as I say, not as I do, and and oh oh boy, yeah. there's so much more to unpack here. But yeah, that's that's my basic first thought though. Yeah, I mean, real in brief, we'll definitely come back to this one because Max has uh, uh, some choice thoughts about it. But uh, in brief, when I looked at this extended Reddit post that had a lot of videos in it um, that were essentially all of these YouTube personalities just shitting all over fans and movie watchers um, because they didn't like the fact that those fans disagree with them sometimes vehemently or emotionally or whatever... Um, it all just sort of, it just seemed like the entire conversation just devolved to childhood name-calling. And yeah. these guys aren't helping. They're just sort of, you know, like, continuing the process. Even guys that I respect, I used to, like, be a subscriber to Mark Kermode because I liked the amount of research that he seemed to do when it comes to movies and stuff. But then he got on his feminist high horse uh, for a while, and I was like, nope, we're done. <laughs> so, um, and scene. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so we'll come back to this one. Uh, let me start the next story. Okay, Mass Effect designer openly racist against white people. People that can people looking to find a way to change the world through their career is not uncommon. Actors often use their influence to draw attention to various charities and causes. Musicians like Bono make use of their reach to try and feed the hungry or save the planet in some way. And sometimes game developers and designers also want to make a statement. But when you take someone's desires to make a large impact on the world, add in intersectional feminism and progressive politics, you can miss the mark in a really big way. Enter Manveer Eyre, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, designer for the upcoming Mass Effect Andromeda. Manveer seems to have drank the SJW poison Kool-Aid, and he has posted tweets about white people that would have surely been considered racist if the races were reversed. And this goes all the way back as far as 2011. But should we care? Perhaps it's more a matter of principles not being treated universally, both by Twitter as well as Manveer for me, and not a matter of being offended. And that's, that's the brief. I mean, uh, I saw this, just to, to, to give you guys some context, uh, Ian Miles Chong, who, uh, former SJW Reformed, now writes, uh, I think, believe for Heat Street. Uh, he wrote an article about it. Uh, about well, his um, outside Manveer. too, Gamer Ranks as well. Yeah, and Gamer Ranks, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, when I saw it, I was like, well, I mean, you know, uh, there's a developer that's a social justice warrior that, that hates white people. I'm not surprised. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not necessarily calling for his job or his head on the stick, so. Um, frankly, because that'd be hypocritical, right? So. Well, eh, I don't think it's hypocritical, but it's, it's a little bit hyperbolic, perhaps. But I think there's definitely a discussion to be had about this, and I have some things I wanted to say about it, but I will, I will wait. I will digress. Okay, until so we will also uh, discuss that. Yeah. One. I definitely that want to fine. talk about this for sure, though. Okay. Your turn, Scott. Oh, it's me again. Let's see here. Oh, it's a short one. Good. Maybe I can get through a get through this without sounding like a complete retard. Um, rugby star of accused of rape after Tinder booty call. Newcastle Falcons rugby player Zach Kibridge had been accused of rape following a sexual encounter with a woman he connected to on the popular hookup and dating app Tinder. The accuser, who remains anonymous at this time, said that Kilbridge had used fear and force to rape her, though Kilbridge told police the sex was forceful and passionate as well as reciprocal. According to Kibridge, his date was upset that he couldn't stay to cuddle after sex because he had to be up the next, <clears throat> be up early for training, and she felt bucked and ditched. He also pointed out that he had been raised to respect women. The trial continues. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, we can. I think we we definitely. I want to say a few things about this this case as well. Um, but it is interesting that. And I thought this was really interesting from the source that we know the guy accused of rape, 
but we don't have the name of the woman who accused him. That's that was the first thing that stood out very strongly, and the fact that he he found her on Tinder, they got together, they banged, and then he had to leave right away, and so she felt rejected because she wanted to stay with him. Um, he wanted she wanted him to stay, and he couldn't because he had to train the next day. So um, and then she uh, her actually it was her flatmate that. Um, made the accusation of rape that called the police. So that that's just another factoid. All right. So yeah, I don't know if you guys want to talk about this case a little bit more. We can. Uh, this is just another you know in a long line of cases that sort of show you how dangerous it is uh, when you are um, accused of rape and and how the trial is ongoing. So. Well, and it also shows you uh, that there is there is a lack of parity when it comes to these situations where his name is being released and could potentially harm his career while she is being kept anonymous. Yeah. All right, so next story. Uh, rich wives being told to get a job after meal ticket divorce. Divorce lawyers say that they are seeing a marked increase in cases where family courts agree to maintenance for only a limited amount of time so that the divorced wives can find a job. In the case of Tracy Wright, for example, who's 51, she was told to get a job rather than expect to live off of maintenance from her ex-husband, Ian Malcolm Wright. While Mrs. Wright insisted she should not have to work, Judge Justice Pitchford, what an awesome name for a judge, <laughs> said that divorcees involving children over the age of seven should be prepared to work for a living. Family lawyer Holly Tootle has remarked on her experience with women who have been forced to come to terms with the idea of how having to work for a living and now find a job while so late in life and after not having worked for three decades or more is affecting them. So what do we think about this? I think it's pretty interesting, actually. This is this is a level of parody that we very seldomly seem, uh, see. Um, and it's it's kind of a welcome change, to be quite honest. Yeah, I'm glad uh, to see a judge holding a woman accountable under a circumstance that you know no no man would get any concession for that. In fact, he'd be called a lazy bum for having not worked the previous three decades. Right. Yes. All right, Scott. Last story. Oh Jesus! Here we go. Oh wait, can I read this one? I was going to say this is Max one. Max, it? you can do it if you like. Yeah. Sure. Please. Yeah, please. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with Hollywood blockbusters like Suicide Squad that just came out uh, this past week, uh, there's heart-stopping action. And with heart-stopping action, there are stuntmen. Where there are stuntmen, there are bruises, broken bones, and, God forbid, impalements. Unlike other statistics that involve harm inflicted on one's person, there are no immediate statistics available in regards to how many injuries and what types of injuries stuntmen suffer from. As action adventure movies continue to get bigger and flashier, it might be useful to start creating these statistics so that the people who help create these unique chills and thrills can be protected, right? It's a large discussion, one that some people might believe needs, you guessed it, a gendered focus. But it's not the discussion the Honey Badgers wish to have, rather it's our good old friends at The Guardian. The Guardian is drawing attention to sexism bred from market forces, as Brian put it in Skype chat earlier, even though they would like you to believe it is born from pure prejudice. Unlike some stuntmen, stunt women are often dressed in, quote, clothes as flimsy as paper doilies and are forced to meet Hollywood's demands for ever-shrinking waistlines without losing the muscles they depend on for work. Unlike their male counterparts, stunt women resort to using things like crash pads made from gel to protect themselves, the same that... Uh, figure skaters use, right? And thankfully, most of the stunts are not life-threatening, according to Charlize Theron's uh, main stunt double, Dana Grant, uh, who she's worked with on films like um, Mad Max, uh, Fury Road, most recently. She just notes that it hurts a lot more. This is interesting because she also notes an instance where she got impaled by a dagger through her cheek and nasal cavities after she slipped on a hill wearing, as, as she put, very feminine shoes. Grant, along with the other stunt women interviewed in this article, take on a very healthy, respectable, sorry, respectable attitude towards their job. Quote, it's just what needs to be done for the film, according to Grant. They even present a sense of camaraderie with their male peers, noting that no matter how padded they may be, there's likely going to be some sharp object that finds an unpadded portion of the body. Now, putting aside the contrasting tenor of both the Guardian's opinions and those of the stunt women, it raises an interesting question. 
are stunt women more at risk because Hollywood places these unrealistic beauty standards on its subjects, or are there more nuances here that The Guardian is missing? All right. Well, I have some thoughts about uh, about the stunt stuntman stunt woman uh, discussion, which I, I did sort of touch on. I think that there are market forces at work, but we can get more into that um, if in the discussion portion. Uh, and I, I think that uh, overall, I will say that from what I looked into, um, while the, while women do often have to dress in the clothing that their female actress counterparts have before uh, stunts sort of sequences begin, um, there are far more fatalities on the male side of stunt thing, uh, on, uh, of stunt activity rather, At least, especially in the 1970s um, and I believe early 80s as well. Uh, one example is, and you mentioned Mad Max, which is really funny. In the Road Warrior, there is a famous death of a stuntman that is actually on film, and it's uh, a point where one of the vehicles, um, I believe, uh, flips, and someone is thrown from their vehicle, and that person did not survive. Um, but they left it in the film, and so I, I don't know that that's, you know, if, if that's an ethical problem, or if they spoke to the family, or what. But or maybe it was in the contract. Who knows? But uh, the, there, it, to make the argument that there is sexism is a problem within the stunt community or industry or whatever you want to call it um, that is specifically targeting women is I think that's a bit of a bridge too far. Yeah. And we can go into that though. But <laughs> um, okay, so those are all of the stories in brief. Now we'll go back. Uh, I think Max wanted to say something about the movie critics versus John Q. Public with uh, these YouTube movie critics and stuff. What, what were, did you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I did. Uh, see, the thing is, I do... Um, like my entire existence revolves around the art of film, right? And as a result, I do listen to a lot of podcasts, and a couple of those are the ones that uh, this guy listed, like the Schmoes know and John Campia. John Campia, who I've actually been listening to for the better part of a decade. He's actually one of the main people that influenced the way that I talk about uh, geek fandom types of stuff, right? And... Why I will say, like, obviously, as somebody who involved with the community that we're all a part of on YouTube, what with Gamergate and all that crap, um, you know, I'm not that big of a fan of the way that certain uh, industries, uh, pundits and critics, tend to uh, talk to their fans. I gotta defend a couple of the people uh, that were listed in this Reddit uh, post by what's his name, John Q. Public. Yeah. So, in regards to the schmoes, no. What I will say is that I think that what John Q is seeing in both the Schmozno and John Campia is a little bit, well, not really a little bit. I think it's really overblown because from what I understand, uh, both Campia and the guys at Schmozno, like Christian Harloff and Mark Ellis, they are actually speaking legitimately about the way that uh, their fans are sort of treating them. For example, um, Ghostbusters. I know, I'm sorry we have to bring this up again, but it's really uh, pertinent to the discussion. It's all right. What happened was uh, a few, almost a week before Ghostbusters came out, John Campia got to see uh, the movie, and he put out a review on his channel. And even before the movie came out, uh, the reviews, uh, sorry, the likes and dislikes ratio on his video uh, leans slightly more towards the dislikes and the likes. Now, how is that at all... Uh, Plausible? How is that at all fair if the people that are rating this uh, movie, this uh, video, uh, haven't even seen the movie, right? Mm -hmm. And you see like comments on the video. Like I'll bring it up right now. I was looking at it while we were reading out the stories. Uh, there was a guy who left a comment that said "fake paid review," and it had 64 upvotes. But then again, look, that doesn't really make sense because even John Campia, somebody who's really, really well beloved in the fan community, he only has 60,000 followers. Whereas people like the Schmoes know have nearly 300,000. Chris Stuckman, well, you know? To, to be fair, really quickly, Max, I can kind of see where they where they might have... I mean, I don't think that there was really a reason for them to say that it was a paid thing. I mean, legitimately. But there is there is some speculation where, uh, where Sony put an embargo on reviews and he got to actually put his out early. So it's kind of like 
well, that's kind of weird. Everybody else has, is under embargo, but he gets to put his out early. Mm. So I think that kind of raised a question with a lot of people. But but I agree with you. The, uh, a lot of the hate these people are getting, it, it comes down to tribalism. It comes down to just blind just tribalism where people are like, well, this person said it's bad, so I'm going to say it's bad too. Yeah. So for sure. But but there, I think, I think there is just a sliver. There is just a sliver of legitimacy to at least thinking that it might have been kind of a little bit shady. Oh, know? absolutely. Like I'm not, I'm not speaking for Stuckman or whatever this other. I think his name is Mark. What's his name? Mark Mark Kermode. Mark Kermode. Yeah, I, I'm not speaking for them. I just know, like I've been listening to the Schmoes Know and John Campy for the past. Well, John, for almost a decade, Schmoes for the last three or four years. Right. I, I just know that the way that they speak about their fans, that despite all this, all the politics and stuff like that, they constantly talk about how much they love their fan base and how much they love to get into these critical discussions and want to try and bring unity through having uh, disagreements and trying to understand where people are coming from. In regards to this Reddit post, I think it is a little bit overblown, but like you said, there might be a little bit of a sliver there that they're referring to where maybe, I don't know, the... Our, our human tendencies tend to get the best of us, and we try to be – well, we don't try to be, but we end up being a little bit more overzealous. Right. You know? So th that's the way that I view uh, this situation when it comes to those two particular uh, representative faces of the movie fan community. You know? right. That's all. All right. I, I, I want to uh, – I actually, I, I think that you make very good points, and I want to add to that by saying that um, from what I see – um, it seems like this is showing the degree to which people are very uh, cynical and disenchanted with reviewers in general. Like of, whether they're doing film or TV or video games or whatever. They just, they have, uh, I think a lot of people have lost faith in them. And I think that when it comes to, specifically with Suicide Squad, there was like, you know, in case you guys don't know, uh, not only was there a petition to try to take down Rotten Tomatoes, despite the fact that Warner Brothers, the studio that put out Suicide Squad and owns DC Comics, owns a third of Rotten Tomatoes, which doesn't make sense, and despite the fact that Rotten Tomatoes doesn't actually post any reviews, all it does is compile the reviews and put them out. Yeah, it's <laughs> it an aggregate. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. do anything except say this is what people are saying. Um, not only did that happen, but apparently like the day that Suicide Squad launched, like the, that Friday... Rotten Tomatoes, the website itself, was down for a little while, and people were saying it's probably DDoS attacks. So right. that is, um, I think, it, it, it's not justified at all. I, I don't think that that's a you know, good move for people to do, but what I think it does sort of speak to is the, the, um, uh, the rift between people that fans have come to, uh, like, to trust uh, to be, you know, fair about, you know, reviewing their their the things that they love that they're passionate about, um, and be, be, between that and the fans themselves, and that may be bleed over from because a lot of times, you know, people that are involved in geek culture, they're they're also they're not just you know big movie fans. They they also play video games and they also like to read comic books or or whatever, or watch TV. So a lot of this stuff has a lot of crossover. And I'm, I'm thinking, this is one of the reasons why I thought this was an interesting story, um, is that I wonder if there, that, that rift isn't growing more so, and the fact that, you know, you combine that with another important factor is that uh, people who are big fans of, of DC Comics, they really, really wanted this movie to be a success. They wanted to leave it so much that when the reviews came out and they were negative, they got angry at, um, you know, at the reviewers. They thought there must be a conspiracy they're, which is what they did. They said, "Oh, you guys, there, there's a bias. You know, the, the the people are bought and paid for by, you know, I don't know, some other company or whatever." They <laughs> just, they, they seriously did. Even though, again, it does, not only does it not make sense because you know Warner Brothers owns part of the stock and Rotten Tomatoes has absolutely they don't do anything but put the reviews together. And on top of that, if you look at um, Rotten Tomatoes reviews, uh, com compile reviews for other Warner Brothers films like the Dark Knight trilogy uh, and the old Batman movies, you'll see that those are really good reviews. <laughs> so, you know, s some of them I think are at a, almost 100%, like The Dark Knight, for example. Yeah. You know what's funny is there's, there's actually, I saw this person was writing about this, and they're like, there's a conspiracy against DC movies. They do this to all the DC movies. And it's like, and you look back at the DC movie library, and it's literally two movies. 
Yeah. It's Batman or it's, uh, Superman, Man of Steel, and fucking Batman versus Superman. It's like they're doing it to all of them. It's like it's like this this huge systemic yeah, they're, problem. Yeah, they're blowing with two it up. Movies. And yeah, I think like, that there's calm down with the rhetoric already. You yeah, know? yeah Jesus and Christ. I think what you're looking at is you know there there's it's not as simple as you know the studio is um uh the the well, not the studio I'm sorry it's not as simple as there is some clandestine uh, organization out there that's out to ruin DC Cinematic Universe films, and it's yeah. also not as simple as the fan base is a bunch of hateful trolls <laughs> that live in their mother's basements that are acting like crybabies because, you know, some of the stuff that uh, John Kempia and uh, what the Flick guy said was, you know, they, they did make videos uh, that were talking about, you know, how they were insulted and they were saying, please, you know, before you post a comment... Think about it for a second, because you probably wouldn't. And then the women on the panel said, oh, they got it worse. They got rape threats. They got death threats and so on. It's not as simple as all of those things. I think that they got to look at, you know, what you're seeing is, first of all, I think that if you're a YouTube reviewer, um, you should probably look at the, um, instead of focusing on the few people that have, like, really rabid and negative criticisms, because you're always going to have those people, you're always going to have like, those few people that are like, I want you to die in a fire, or I know where you live and I'm coming to get you. You're al- always going to have those people, always. Instead, focus on the, 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 the majority. And if the majority are saying negative things, then maybe take a moment to self-reflect. A critic that is okay with criticizing everybody else should also be ready to criticize themselves. So, you know, there is that. Now, that doesn't mean you have to take somebody's insults and vitriol to heart, but on the internet, this is something that you're just going to have to deal with. And you also have to understand that everybody on the internet is an individual, so those people do not reflect anything except their own opinions, just as you as a critic also are only reflecting of your opinions. To the fans, I would say this. If someone reviews a film in the way that you don't want, then you don't have to listen to them. You There's can go hundreds. See it yourself. Yeah. yeah. Just go see it yourself and see if it's something that you're, you, you want. Like, like, I never... I never wait until a critic that I respect or don't respect reviews something before I go see right. it. The only time I do is if I have no idea whether or not it's going to be good. And even then, I prefer word of mouth from people I can trust, who I know personally, over some stranger you know, that, that I don't know what their tastes are. Because again, people's um, views are often affected by their worldview, by their ideology, by their other experiences. Like if you have someone that you know, never ever watched kung fu movies and they don't like them and all of a sudden they have to review a new kung fu movie, how can you trust them to know what they're talking about? So, I mean, you know, even, even if they're good at reviewing films. And another thing, too, is like you were saying, it's like you, you generally look to people that you know because you not only know them, but you know their, you, you know their history as far as like the kind of things that they like and the things that they kind of gravitate towards. But with um, when you're looking at reviewers online, I, I you know I, I don't I don't want to be like tin foil here, but you know you don't always know their motivations. There may be things going on behind the scenes that you don't that you're not privy to that could influence the things that they're saying. So I you know personally for me it's like like you were saying it's like I talk to friends I talk to people that I know that that I have an idea I have a barometer of what they what their likes and dislikes are and that I can kind of measure it against my own stuff. Um, but yeah, it's just the, the 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 whole the whole thing here is, an, and I hate to be so flippant about it too, is that it's kind of like you know fucking toughen up. Yeah. And, you know, I I hate saying that, but there is with the internet, you have to understand that there is a certain degree of you gotta fucking just not give a fuck. You really have to be able to. You have to turn the. Uh, you have to tune that shit out. You just have to say, I'm not gonna fucking read the comment section, and if I do, like you were saying. Those comments are not emblematic of everybody. They, people no. are speaking as individuals. They're not speaking for the fucking entire geek culture or whatever culture you're, you know, particularly talking about at that moment. Yeah. So you have to, you really do, you really sincerely have to separate yourself from those things. And I know sometimes it gets kind of hard because people, like, if you fucking dip in and you read something and somebody's being particularly nasty, it can kind of, you know, we're human. Things get to us. That's just that's just how we are. But you really do. You have to fucking toughen up. You have to just fucking just be like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let this get to me because it does me no good personally. So you know, yeah. it sucks that people are saying nasty things, but toughen the fuck up, man. 
Uh, you know, I'm not, yeah. As another example, going back to Mark Remote, who I used to watch, right? Um, the the when I stopped watching him, what when I decided to unsubscribe was when he reviewed Ghostbusters. Now, before the reason why is not because he didn't review it the way I think he should have reviewed it. I was indifferent. I was actually I watched it because I wanted to know what he thought. The reason why I unsubscribed is because that's when his his feminist ideology came all the way out. And he basically said, anybody who does not like this movie is a misogynist. Right. And that's where this is coming from. Anyone who disliked the trailer, that's the reason. And I said, okay, you're making sweeping generalizations around about people who have clearly made it very clear in the comment section and in other places that the reason they may not have been impressed had nothing to do with the thing that you're saying. And you're trying to bring validity to something that, that doesn't need it. If you liked it, then just speak to its... Um, just speak to the, the things that you think are good about it and then leave it at that. But he actually spent a, a good portion of his review basically going on a tirade on people he doesn't know for reasons he cannot possibly understand because in order for someone to be accused of sexism or racism or any other bigotry, you would have to know that person. Otherwise, you're just, you're just essentially like... Um, uh, you're basically saying you're a mind reader and you know where, where their opinions are coming from, which he's not. And, now, and you know what I did was I was just like, well, okay, so Mark Remote has an ideology. That ideology is going to affect his judgment. His ideology and mine, they don't line up. I don't think I can benefit from his reviews. So I don't need to subscribe to him. And to be quite frank, it's it's fine. Like, I mean, I'm not going to say he shouldn't be on YouTube or he shouldn't be able to continue to make you know reviews or whatever. And I didn't even make a. The only thing I made, uh, I made a comment saying that you know it probably would be wise if he actually tried to understand why people didn't like it instead of assuming and essentially, um, uh, you know, in, imbuing or in, inserting malice in people that don't agree with his worldview. Which I would have said about anybody, you know, no matter whether they were a reviewer or not. Right. You know, like like kind of like when Angry Joe talked about Gamergate uh, and like a couple of years ago when it was in high you know, in high swing or full swing or whatever, and he basically made assumptions about the people that were Gamergate supporters. Right. And I was like, well, Angry Joe, I'm glad I never subscribed to you because you're not the kind of person that wants to understand something. You're the kind of person that wants to pass judgment on something. And that's okay. You should be allowed to do that. But I don't necessarily need to support that right. because, you know, that, that's not the way that I work. I want to understand something and get all the facts. Well, you know. and let's let's make something clear here too. When we're talking about people in YouTube, you know, ourselves included, um, I'll, I, well, I'm going to include myself into this. Um, we're not professionals per se, and these people technically aren't professionals. I mean, they get paid for what they're doing, but when you look at when when you look at people on YouTube and you measure them up against people like Richard Roper and people of that caliber who actually have worked for decades and actually, you know, have gone to school for these things and, and taken journalism classes and learned the correct way to do these things, there is there is a very there's a very big disparity there that, because people like Roper understand that he has to separate himself from his feelings, his personal feelings and from you know and from what he's reviewing. It's kind of like being a defense lawyer. You may know that the person is guilty and they're doing something fucked up and but your job is to be impartial and try and give them the best defense you can. You yep. know, it's it, it, maybe it's not the best analogy, but I think it's I think it's somewhat apt to this kind of situation. It's like we're talking about people who are just people who found audiences on the internet. These they yeah. weren't necessarily professionals. This is just something they were doing as in a hobbyist capacity or a, you know or a citizen journalist kind of capacity. So and I hate to I hate to be like you know these aren't legitimate voices because they're allowed their they're allowed their opinions and more sure. power to them for sharing them and for finding their audiences and for cultivating these kind of things and and becoming popular that's not easy but take into account who these people are um, not to yeah. dismiss them but to just understand kind of where they're at and the, you know so that's just that's well, something to consider and think about yeah I mean that's basically what I uh, what I'm uh, you know what as an aside I miss. Um, Siskel and Ebert. And the reason why I do, I was just thinking about that, okay? Same. Well, the reason why I do is because Siskel and Ebert were two guys that did not agree on a whole lot. They had different worldviews, and they would review films together. And, like, when they disagreed, like, if one of them liked a film and the other one did not, 
you know, they would hash it out and you got to watch them. And the benefit of that was that if you understood the reasoning behind why Gene Siskel did not like a movie versus why Roger Ebert didn't like a movie or did, then you could work out for yourself which one of their perspectives shares the values of the things that you like so you can decide whether or not you would watch it. Like, for example, if they, they could both give a movie thumbs down. I remember Roger Ebert, he hated the film Big Trouble in Little China. He hated it. <laughs> and I could not disagree with that man for, more because that is one of the most perfect films ever made. Yeah, it's but fun as hell. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's an amazing movie. Yep. But I don't Jack think that... Jack Burton. <laughs> he, he, he <laughs> Old right. Jack Burton says... <laughs> He doesn't, but I, I, know, I know every line in Big Trouble in Little China. Like, I know that movie backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. And I understand, but when I read his review, I understand why he doesn't like it. But what he considers deal breakers don't phase me in the slightest. In fact, I embrace those things. I think, oh, no, it's, yeah, it's can't be writing. That's what's great about it. You know, like, that's, the, those are the things that make it appealing. So when it comes, at the end of the day, m my thing is, um, and I even, at, at the end of my write-up, I wrote, do we need critics to validate our tastes? And I think that's a very important thing to think about. Absolutely. If, if What the Flick, which, by the way, is connected to the Young Turks, right. if they despise a movie because of its sexism and racism and whatever it is that they decided to project onto it, ask yourself if that's a deal-breaker for you. If, if, you know, like if they're, because they're going to, they're going to have their opinions, but... You can have your own, and if you are, uh, you know, and this can go for anything that people are critics, whether it's a book, because remember what happened with the sad puppies, whether it's uh, television, whether it's video games, because you already, we have already been through that, okay? You just basically look at the stuff that, that reviewers are going to say, this is not, like, this makes me uncomfortable, I don't like this, or I don't think this is well done, and then just decide for yourself if it is. Um, I don't really think we need critics that much. I mean, they, they can be helpful. You know, like I, I watch Jeremy Johns sometimes, and I, but I, I listen to why he says I like or dislike this thing, and I decide if that's a fit for me because yeah. I'm not Jeremy Johns. I know we're not going to like the same stuff. Well, so, you know what's funny about the Turks in particular that you bring them up is when you, um, like I used to actually follow with the flick um, until about, I don't know, probably about eight or nine months ago when they started, they really started pushing kind of their they're kind of, I hate saying their agenda, but they really started pushing their own personal politics into the movie reviews and stuff. Yeah. And it's like, you know, that's that's unavoidable to a certain extent, you know. But sure. they really they really started making, it was a very obvious concerted effort to kind of push these narratives and their their focus into the reviews. And, not, and they, they showed they lacked impartiality. And it felt like, okay, you know what, it's like these are people that I actually liked before that were being, you know, critical of film and we're, we're talking about film in a way that was it was interesting and it was you know informative but then they started kind of getting too political and I, and I kind of think that was part of the atmosphere of that that culture within the Young Turks ecosystem to a certain degree so it kind of bummed me out but yeah and I forgot my next point but so yeah oh, so, well, that. <laughs> so okay. I mean real I also want to say that Max said you know I think we absolutely do need critics um, mm. And, and I, I think yeah. that well, I'm not saying that we don't need them, but what I'm saying is that um, critics can be helpful to. Yeah, we, and I like to watch a lot of different ones. Go ahead, Max. If you want to? Yeah, we don't we don't need to live vicariously through critics. We just need to listen to what they say, figure out what we agree and disagree with, and help that to inform and strengthen our own uh, case. Well, not case, but just our own opinion. Yeah, but like in general, they're not the final arbiter of what is or is not good. It comes exactly. down to, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, I could, if, if they have, like, and here's another thing too, is if you see, uh, you know, like a movie's probably shit if people who don't normally agree with each other at all, all of them, like if you watch like a hundred critics and none of them agree on, on a lot of stuff and they all say this is a bad movie or this is a great movie, you know, then you know, okay, this is probably a winner. You know, like, I don't know too many critics that said, fucking Toy Story 3, that's a piece of shit. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> if they are, they have no soul, right? right. So... <laughs> <laughs> or they're Bob Chipman. Uh oh Yeah. Excuse me. I had something stuck in my throat. It was a cuck. <coughs> Excuse me. But, yeah, and one other, one other thing is uh, to bring... Uh, the reason why I brought up Chris Stuckman is, is um, I actually normally have... Uh, I, I like his reviews, too. 
but this is more speaking to the way that he reacted when he was criticized, even though he doesn't have a problem criticizing, and sometimes really brutally so. Apparently, and I don't know the whole story behind this, but apparently he rewrote Man of Steel. No, Batman v Superman, right? He wrote a pitched a script of Batman v Superman that a lot of people did not like. Now, I don't know why they didn't like it, but essentially the criticism he got made him very upset, and he basically made a video that he said he didn't want to make, but the video that he did not want to make went on for about a half an hour in which he got teary-eyed about um, you know, how much abuse he got for um, his proposed write-up. Now, I don't know, I, I'm not taking sides in any, because I don't know like the degree to which he got you know, um, really, really negative comments. But it goes back to the thing I said before. If you're a critic and you spend your time criticizing, then you will also have to expect to be criticized. And the way that you react to criticism, um, it's probably, unless you really want to have a dialogue, it's it may be uh, a good idea to consider that you want to focus on the people who are making the best arguments instead of the people who are simply trying to rustle your feathers or rustle your jimmies. Because those people, that they don't really have opinions. They just want to see you get mad. And you don't want to respond to that. So, And I'm, I'm like, you know, I get criticism on every show. There's at least one person that says, would you fucking stop with the doge? Um, there's always one person. And you know what? It's fine. I'm, I'm going to keep doing it because I, I want to. And, um, you know, I, I, under, I, I understand where you're coming from. It's not a perfect program. Sometimes the eyeballs are weird. But uh, this is just what I want to do. So, all right. Because it's fun. Yes, because it's fun. Yep. Y'all are haters. And um, it's adorable. Uh, yeah, well, that too. <laughs> it's uh, just one more thing, really quickly, about this um, is that uh, part of the one of the problems uh, that doesn't come up uh, uh, when discussing these kind of things is that there are instances where there are people that are being paid to gaslight you. This is this has been shown in many other you know fandoms. Not paid just to gaslight. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. can you give me an example? Um, well, God, I'm 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 fucking I'm at a loss at the moment. But there okay. there have been instances where where people, be they reviewers or whoever they were, you know, they said something uh, nasty about something, and then you know there are people that are well, Gamergate actually is one of them. Um, I. I know of an instance where somebody was actually paid to fucking go after Gamergate people, mm. and this person eventually changed their mind about it because they found out what it was actually happening and saw that they were in the wrong, and they switched sides, so to speak. But um, there are there are instances where you know I, I'm I'm going to imagine that some of these people that are getting a lot of this hate, it's probably it's probably being pushed. You know, and again, not to be too tinfoily, but having having direct knowledge of this kind of stuff, it's just like. It, it, you know, I have to imagine that some some of this is there's that component is there. It's possible. It, it just, yeah. I mean, Competition can be dirty. Yeah. You know. I mean, I'm just saying. So there's 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 so many different things going on here, though. It's like there's you know there's trolls that just do this for the fucking walls, you know, and there's people that can't just understand that opinions happen on the internet and they can't not say something about it you know they have to be upset about it so I mean there's just there's this is a this is a very broad discussion there's a lot of a lot of yeah. things to unpack in this so. definitely it's it's a bigger thing but essentially yeah. uh yeah we, we there's some things to think about so yeah. um real quick before we move on to the next story did anybody see suicide squad not yet no max yeah uh, what do you think just just real wanna, short I don't want to talk about it Oh, okay. So, <laughs> um, that's all right. I actually had a... I don't know what it is, but I have a I have a pretty good instinct about whether or not I want to see something, and I had a bad feeling about that. And it was mainly tied to, like, all the... You know, there were rewrites and things that were changed, and I was like, ooh, that's not good. You know, when you hear about... They, they reshot a bunch of stuff, and they changed things, like, weeks before the film's release. That makes me wonder. Or when they put an embargo on something, like they did right. that with Fan 4 Stick, Right. Yeah, um, and so, Ghostbusters. Yeah, and Ghostbusters. And yeah. eh, there's some cause for alarm when you hear yeah. that. So, Sorry, and it didn't work out for the Guardians Quinn's of the out. Galaxy. Yeah, and the fact that Harley Quinn's outfit and character design is just fucking abysmal, too. Please. <laughs> oh, God, uh, so I will bad. say this, though, uh, Scott. Uh, it, I, I know a lot of people don't really like the outfit for Harley Quinn. I don't, I don't really care one way or the other for it, but I will say... Uh, what's the actress's name? Margot, Margot Robbie. 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 Yeah. Captures the essence of Harley Quinn perfectly. 
Yeah. Perfect. Too bad she looks like a second-rate suicide girl, though. It's like, she's <laughs> Kind of well, she is in the Suicide Squad. I'm just well, saying. I mean, well, Jared Leto. <laughs> yeah, he's Jared, a fucking juggalo. Yeah, Jared Leto looks Ugh. like a juggalo. So, God, like so that shop at Hot Topic or something. Um, oh. <laughs> I think we're gonna see a resurgence of Hot Topic stores. Oh, please now. God, no. Uh, but <laughs> anywho, all right. So next story that people want to comment. Uh, Scott, you said you wanted to say something about um, the Mass Effect uh, designer that. Oh, uh, making Manveer. Manveer. Yeah, Manveer. Yes. Manveer. Um, you know, this is this is a really kind of sticky situation, um, because uh, you know, in in at first blush, you can kind of let hyperbole and, and that whole thing kind of get in the way and be like, oh, I want his job, fuck this guy, he's a real piece of shit. But then, like, you have to kind of come back to reality and think about this a little bit. And the thing that really sticks out to me is that. This person has been doing this and engaging in this kind of conversation for a really long time. And I I cannot imagine that his employers at Bioware don't know about it. I can't imagine that the people that he works with don't know about it. And I can't imagine that that does not create a an air of toxicity in the workplace. Um, I, you know, I obviously, I don't know what it's like to work with this person. Um, I have no frame of reference for it, but just when you look at his tweet history, just by itself, it seems pretty. It seems pretty damning, um, and that, to me, that gives me that gives me a moment of pause because, like I said, I just I feel like this is this has got there's there's got to be something weird going on with where he works if they see this stuff since like you know. Uh, 2010, 2011, or whenever he started. 2011. Tweeting. Well, at yeah. least that's how far back Ian Miles Chong found the right. Um, found those tweets because they they cannot they absolutely cannot not be aware of this. That that's that's an impossibility in today's um, you know social media climate. They just can't. When somebody is in that kind of position, they you know they look out for this kind of stuff. So it just kind of it's bothersome in that regard. Um, but it's bothersome in the fact that also in the fact that he's saying these things and apparently he believes them. Um, you know, he says like uh, one of his tweets is talking about how you know white people are unaware of whatever the power and this that and the other and all that. You know, the the usual kind I, of I anti. Can, I can tell you some of them. Yeah. Um, you know, he it's said, just... bragged about scaring white people with his brown yeah. skin as payback for racism after 9/11. Right. Which uh, there's no way of knowing that he's actually scaring anybody, but this is what he says. Uh, he's mocked them for wh- their white fragility. Um, yeah, that's the one, the white fragility. Yeah, yeah and like he that. also wrote, "I'm officially following 1,000 people now. I think I'm going yeah. to spend part of the day clearing out who I follow, especially white men." He followed it up with saying, "I follow too many white dudes, so if you get called tough shit." Blame the dominance of your species, yeah. race, gender, species. That, Apparently, that's their own. <laughs> that was, <laughs> yeah, that was that was actually specifically the one I wanted to talk about. Was that yeah. white um, is a species? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Apparently, I mean white white men are a species. Yeah. Man, Veer, he knows. I mean, obviously, he tweeted it, so it yeah. must be true. Um, well, but okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the idea of that this this thing about. Uh, this thing about white dominance and all this kind of thing. I just when I, when I hear people say things like this, it kind of drives me nuts. You know, having grown up in piss poor ass East Side Baltimore, um, you know, having not ever had the advantages of being part of the patriarchy, but being a white male at the same time. I just when people say these kind of things, it's kind of maddening to me. It's mm-hmm. like you, you're, you have you've created this fiction, or you have bought into this fiction that somebody else has created, and you were you were assigning all this malice to people you don't even know. And he's like, and and he kind of he talks about it like in some of his tweets where he's like, oh, they you know white people they don't get it, whatever, da 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 da, da and we can ignore them because they're just you know white privilege, whatever. And it's like, no, no, it's not like that. It's like my white fragility has nothing to do with it. There is no white fragility. I just, I don't find the idea of denigrating other people for the color of their skin a positive thing. Uh, and and to assign full, you know, it's like, oh, what do you call, it's, it's kind of like the old joke, what do you call a black kid with a bike? A thief. You know, it's just like, oh, now all black kids with bikes are thieves. It's like, you know, it's that same kind of stupidity, that same kind of ignorance and, and myopic tribalistic thinking 
whereby you can just write off an entire subsection of people just because you've got a fucking gripe or something. And it's just, it, it's kind of sad. I honestly feel sad for this person. I legitimately do, that he has such a fucking poor view of other humans. Mm. Um, it's just, it's it's kind of pathetic. It really is kind of pathetic. And as far as, like, you know, people calling for his job, that's, you know, that's fine. You can be upset about it, but it, I, don't, I don't know if it's worth taking his job as much as it is maybe telling, you know, Bioware... We don't appreciate this person being in that position, you know. It's or, or or saying like, you know what? I find the things that this person is saying objectionable. You don't have to like, you know, get all up in arms and be like, we're going to take this guy out or anything. But you know, let them know you don't like it. Be kind. Be polite. Be humane about it. But yeah, this just this just sucks, man. This sucks no matter who's doing it. I mean, yeah. white, black, whatever color he is, because you know he doesn't like whitey. Just don't don't. Don't well, that's just it. Pull off full sale because you have a grudge. You know, it just it's it's pathetic. It's it shows it shows a real lack of empathy and humanity within a person yeah. when they say things like this. So yeah, I mean, like you know, I'm uh, I'm a huge uh, in huge support for free speech. I think people should be able to say whatever the fuck they want, and even that includes what people consider hate speech. I don't think right. that I think that once you start creating a category called hate speech, you're basically um, you're, it's a slippery slope, and I don't mean and that you're as regulating well. speech at that you're, point. Yeah, because you're basically you're arbitrarily deciding what can and cannot be said yeah. by making a classification of speech called hate speech. So I won't, I wouldn't actually say that this guy shouldn't have a job or he shouldn't, you know, be able to, uh, you know, uh, ru- operate in this country anymore or whatever, or that he should be removed from Twitter. But I find it really, really telling, and this is why I summed up my write-up by saying, for me, this is more of a problem because it's a principle that Twitter is not applying universally. If Milo had been saying this about another race of people, he would be gone, and Milo is gone because he has been critical, or he's, you know, said stuff that Twitter doesn't appreciate, and, and feminists and social justice warriors got him pulled out. But this guy has been able to say you know, really um, insulting things about white people as a whole, and he's still on Twitter. So my, my, my issue is more so that, you know, these spaces are not um, applying these principles universally. I wouldn't actually Absolutely. call this guy's, you know, I, wouldn't, I don't want this guy's job to lose his job. However, that being said, I think this is the problem with intersectional feminism and intersectionality in social justice. You basically create a class of people whatever it is, in this case it's white, straight, it's white, straight, heterosexual men, and you say these are the people that it is completely okay to be as mean, as insulting, and as hateful as possible because they have earned it collectively over thousands of years of oppression of everybody else. Right. Colonialism, institutionalized racism, um, institutionalized misogyny, whatever you want to call it, and as a result, these people, this class of person is okay to shit on. And no, it's hard for people to make arguments against it. So, I mean, if you're thinking in that intersectional way. Like, for example, one of the other things he said is that uh, when a Sikh man was assaulted in Chicago, he held all white people accountable. He wrote, yeah. the real terrorists are already on American soil, and they are white. And he is also one of those people that believes the white man came and took the land from the Native Americans violently, and before that, Native Americans were all hanging out and you know, smoking peace pipes and using all of the buffalo and they weren't hurting anybody and then the white man came and introduced them to violence which is something they had no idea existed <laughs> and just stole it from them and that's just, you know, and that's that's the mentality these people have which is completely insane. And I always find that particularly funny for a very odd reason. Um, among my ancestral heritage is the Mohawk tribe. That's not their real name. Um, their real name means like people of the cliffs or something, and I, I have trouble pronouncing it. But the name that gets used for them, Mohawk, is actually a bastardization of the name an enemy tribe used to to name them, to, to talk about them, call them man eaters. So, <laughs> and yeah. that's what that's what white people start. Getting. Well, they wouldn't call them that if they weren't at war with each other. They wouldn't call them, you know, they wouldn't call them something nasty like that if they weren't at war with each other. So here, here I am, descended partly from a tribe that everybody knows by a name that is a denotation of its warlike state. 
-hmm. And I keep hearing from people how peaceful Native <laughs> Americans are. Right. Yeah. Now, 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 and yeah, there were inequalities, and yeah, it, it's not. I'm not saying that it was right for Europeans to come over and just take over the land, but the truth is, it it wasn't um, all on one side. The no. violence wasn't all on one side. And this is yeah, just the way great. things shook out. I mean, it wasn't the, just a land full of hippies. They were actually engaging in war tribally. Yeah, they were fighting each other. Forever. They were fighting yeah. each other, and they had displaced people that were there before them. There's mm -hmm. significant evidence that the Americans that were displaced, that the Native Americans, who, by the way, they, when I go to powwows, nobody says Native American. They all say Indian. Um, so, But uh, they, they displaced a, another set of people before them. And there are stories but you don't get to hear them outside of you know inner circles. You don't get to you you don't hear them talking to the general public about that because they don't want it to be misinterpreted as uh, you know. Well, this excuses what they did. You know, people have been doing bad things to each other for all of eternity. You know, as right. long as there have been people, and the idea that only when white people do bad things should we talk about it as a bad thing is ridiculous. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and, and one last thing about uh, this guy, um, in case you want to know something else about his character, um, he wrote about, I believe, no, he criticized uh, the mankind, the Deus Ex Mankind Divided promo art that was coming out. Um, that that it was like um, Og uh, Lives Matter. About, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was called Og's Lives Matter, which is uh, Og's is short for augmented humans, I believe, and uh, it's for the new Deus Ex. And he was basically, uh, he said that uh, they're appropriating Black Lives Matter, um, <laughs> which originated in the U.S., but you know that if you guys are paying attention, Black Lives Matter, even though it originated in the U.S. and wasn't really founded on m much in the way of facts, then now is in Toronto, London, and Australia, <laughs> oh, where yeah. it, places where it makes no sense at all. Um, but anyway... He said, uh, of course, I'm a visible minority myself and understand the current tension. Um, no, wait, I'm sorry, that's the wrong guy. Uh, I fully support and believe that games should tackle political issues such as civil rights, but the image is being used to sell a game without providing context as to what it really means and whether it's being handled well. It's easy to think that it's belittling an actual real-life group that is trying to save black bodies and black lives. So he's getting upset over something he doesn't actually understand yet because it looks a little bit too much like something that he's really close to despite the fact that it doesn't have anything to do with him. And, and in case folks didn't know this, one of the two main devs on Deus Ex is actually black, and he is the guy responsible for this. So <laughs> That doesn't matter because SJWs get to... They oh, get well. to uh, yeah, they know, can change the It's more like the, great, the, the whole controversy with the Great Wall and Matt Damon... <laughs> How he's in right. it. And like, there's SJWs are like whitewashing, whitewashing, and like, the, it's being developed and produced in fucking China by Chinese people for Chinese people who love Matt Damon. Right, because they Matt Damon him. puts asses in seats. Because Matt Damon puts asses in seats. There you go. And they know they're going to make money on it. Intersectionality. Yes. <laughs> by the um, way, and this is just something to ponder. Um, we don't have to discuss it, but does, does it seem like. Just a coincidence that intersectionality came along at a time when, as a as a sort of as a community, as a country, or as a world, really, we were starting to get along better. We we're starting to eliminate yeah. a lot of the division between races and religions and everything, and then boom, intersectionality intersectionality comes along and it's all back. Yeah, I know it is. It is really interesting. They gotta it, sell you that cure, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> gotta gotta create that disease so we can save the cure. Yeah. So we're gonna move away from uh, the Mass Effect developer and uh, let's move on to. You guys want to talk about the rape accusation story? I think uh, Han Hannah, you want to say something about that, right? Yes, but I would like to let Mike go first because he doesn't talk much. Okay. No. Mike. Right. Okay. Um. Can can we bring up that Telegraph article? Because I want to talk about that. I, I only just found it, and that's what I want to fucking talk about, because it's so strange. The rugby star accused of rape? You mean that one? Yeah, that one. Okay, yeah, let me put it on the screen for you. Uh, hold on just a moment here. I uh, put it up there for the audience, because it, it, they need to see this shit. Yeah, that's the one. Yes. I, so. it's, 
it's it's like a high school newspaper, except it was written by the fucking cheerleaders. It's a story about a casual sexual relationship. That's it. But it, it's a story because he was accused of rape. Even though all the way through this news article is describing a consensual relationship, but one in which the man left after the sex. It's still not illegal, folks. Still not illegal. <laughs> <laughs> in the headline, look at the fucking headline. Come straight in with rugby star accused of rape, left girl feeling she had been bucked and ditched. Got his. Yes. You see what I mean? Im imagine the headline: man accused of murder, left girl saying he almost killed me. <laughs> <laughs> the car carry on reading it. It's consistently hilarious. Yeah. Um. A, a, a rising rugby star accused of raping a student he met on Tinder has admitted making an excuse and leaving her home just minutes after their sexual encounter. It's... Uh, he admitted making an excuse. Making ex an excuse is not a crime, you mental case. <laughs> a, bit, a man accused of theft has admitted getting a receipt. What the fuck? Essentially, this is man hurts girls' feelings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah basically. Now, if I remember right from we talked about this earlier, it wasn't the girl who made the accusation, but her roommate. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it's uh, here. Uh, minutes after she had mes messaged the Aviva Premiership star... No, wait. Uh, yeah, it was right here. After she messaged the Aviva Premiership star pro protesting about his quick exit, so she messaged him, um, be uh, uh, you know, him after his prompt exit, her flatmate messaged and accused him of rape. Well, you know, I, I know whenever, got involved. <laughs> whenever I get raped, I definitely message somebody to bitch that the rapist left too soon afterwards. I mean, because, you know, you want them to stick around after they have just <laughs> traumatized the shit out of you. Um, <laughs> no, my, my, my thinking on this, one of, one of my things... Uh, that, the the that rapist should have stayed and watched <laughs> the movie with her. That's what she yeah. wanted. One of my yeah. things is that I've consistently talked about, but rather quietly on, um, actually on Reddit, I don't think I've talked about it much elsewhere, is uh, an experience of mine where I've been through something like that. There was a guy that a friend of mine tried to accuse of, of raping me because um, uh, I was not happy with something that happened in respect to the encounter. Not the encounter itself, that was quite nice, um, but, but, but details that happened surrounding it were upsetting and it didn't even actually it wasn't nothing of it was his fault it was um, a third party actually that that I was upset about and uh, there was a whole big hullabaloo that came out of that and it's been it's been over 20 years and I don't really want to mess with the people that were involved so I'm not going to give a bunch of details about it other than to say that it was absolutely ridiculous and it goes entirely in t it, it, it it's something that feminists do and and people with feminist led attitudes do but it goes entirely against listen and believe because you're not listening and you're not believing if a woman tells you I had consensual sex and then you accuse the guy of rape because she admits to being upset about a detail involved in it mm -hmm. you know, that is essentially here we go. Uh, Tony 8353 has the perfect term for it. Clusterfuck. You know, this is a clusterfuck. This is a mess. It's the just an clock. absolute fucking mess. You know, he, it's not he said, she said. It's they did and somebody else said. You know, what the fuck is that? What yeah. right does a third party have to come in and define two people's interaction with each other to make one of them the victim of the other one when nobody was claiming to be a victim. Nobody was saying, I, I feel taken advantage of. Nobody was saying, I, I think that I didn't consent to that. You know, I said no and they didn't stop. Nobody was saying that. That is absolutely wrong. That is a moment where you should listen and believe. If she says she, you know, she consented to this, if she was involved in this, and the only thing she's upset about is he didn't stick around long enough, that is a moment when you should listen and believe her saying, I was not raped. Because that's what she basically said by saying he didn't, he didn't stick around long enough. You know, I, yeah. if, she, if he, she was raped, she'd have wanted his ass out of there as quickly as possible. And she would have texted her friend, holy shit, I've just been raped. Thank God he's gone. The, uh, the thing is, too, is that they... 
Oh, good. Go ahead. Oh, no, Mike, go ahead. Sort of jokingly said earlier, uh, maybe uh, rapists should be forced to stay there and watch the movie with her. But when this happens in other countries, he's forced to marry her. And by the time the story makes it over here, it's, oh, a girl forced to marry her rapist. This is that story. <laughs> yeah, he, he actually does. He, make, he, he does admit that he made an excuse, saying that he had to be up early to train. And he couldn't stick around. Uh, in addition, they met on Tinder. Yeah, uh, you that's know, the thing I wanted to point out, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, they met on Tinder. Now, I used to be on Tinder. Tinder is it's made for hookups, mostly. Right. Some people do try to, like, I don't know why, but some people do try to use Tinder to actually, like, find a meaningful relationship. But in general, that is basically the booty call app. That yeah. is, so you're looking for someone in the area who is down to fuck, and then you da- you go down and you fuck them. You know, That's what it's for. Here's the thing, too. This is quoting this woman. I didn't think you were just going to treat me like that, not just sleep with me and then leave. Um... You have a fundamental misunderstanding of what Tinder is. <laughs> yes. I- I'm sorry, but you're a fucking moron. Okay. Yeah. Plain and fucking simple. You are an idiot. And because <clears throat> here's the thing, and because she said that, like, uh, we're, let me look at this again. I didn't think you were going to treat me like that. Not just sleep with me and then leave. Because, and she actually said that. Yeah, um, that's like, I didn't think the dog was going to bite me when I then, killed it repeatedly. So you can actually make the admission that you were expecting him to at least stay to cuddle while you guys watch a movie together, right? and still accuse him of rape, and still have your name protected because she's anonymous in this case. We don't know the name of the woman making the accusation. And still, on top of that, this case is ongoing. The trial continues. That means that it's not even open and shut. Now, and, and here's another thing, too, real quick. Would this even have made headlines or even gone as far as it has if this guy wasn't famous? I mean, I, I hate to say that, but you have to look at this when you're talking about situations like this. This guy is a, you know, he is a professional athlete. Um, and there's at some point there's got to be like, Oh wait, maybe maybe this is happening because this person sees a potential meal ticket coming out of this, you know? And it's just the accusation uh, might not have been uh, made if he wasn't famous, right? Yeah, exactly. might not have. But at the other end of it, there are plenty of of men who are poor, um, who or who would be considered by the the roommate maybe to be too low class for for her roommate. You know, and things like that that, under a similar circumstance, um, might be accused simply for not pandering to the woman's emotions. Right. So I mean, on one hand, yeah, she might have been, she might be digging for fame or gold or some other such thing. But on the other hand, the men that usually end up in jail over stuff like this are the ones who are so broke they can't afford a lawyer. And and public yeah. defenders don't do them any good, you know, or they're of a they're of a history where somebody can make them look like they're more likely to have committed the crime because maybe they held up a convenience store or maybe they um, have been in a lot of fights and and have assault charges on their record and things like that. Um, so it it does happen, uh, and I mean I've known men that have been. Um, accused and the accusation taken seriously because of class issues and because of, of race issues as well. So I, I, I can't say that it's just his fame here. It's partly well, yeah. because I of gynocentrism. Just that, but that might play, you know, there might be a it little could. bit of in here. I mean, we, we obviously don't know all the details, but, you know, yeah. something to I, consider. I, I have one question. Mike might be able to answer this. Um, a public school boy, is that something special bet- besides a boy who attended public school? Um, no. I, is it I, a rare thing? It, I, I forget which way around it is. Which way around is public and and private. No, public is, is, is what we call the posh schools, I think. I see, okay. Because here, public school is the school that is government funded and everything else is private school. So I was kind of confused. They called him a former public school boy, and I was trying to figure out why that detail even mattered. 
Yeah, they did throw that in. I thought it was weird that they mentioned it. They also mentioned that, you know, he's, like, studying for... Um, uh, he's studying for some, like, other, uh, like, pretty high-end degree and that he's got very, very high marks. So there, it seems it speaks to his character in a positive way. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know what sounds the, like. The sounds like they're is. trying to associate a, a rapacious attitude with the popular upper class, you know, kind of guy. Maybe. Yeah, they they are often uh, gender segregated schools. It's it's I think it's illegal to do it in state schools, but. They they the only the only sort of gender segregated schools left are the boarding schools and the public schools. Hmm. Maybe that's what they're saying. Down with 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 the boy schools, but keep the girl schools. Whistle yeah. whistle. Of course. Um, he was uh, you know asked by his barrister uh, if he raped her. All all they have right now is is basically his word against hers right now. What I think yeah. would actually be um, really good evidence is uh, to look at their. Tinder messages, because you know when you when you first meet someone on Tinder, you send messages to each other, and if if you look at the profiles and their messages, it, you might be able to ascertain like you know if they were getting together for a quick um, shag or not. And I'm guessing that they probably were. Uh, according to the story, they uh, hung out um, at her place, put a film on the TV, started talking about. Uh, their tattoos and piercings, and then things got passionate. So it was basically small talk, and then they started boning. And then so, a couple, like 10 minutes after they were done, he got his clothes on and said he had to be up early and left. So he put all that effort into foreplay. And so he was at her apartment all that time. And she had every chance in the world during all that time to say, well, this is all I want. I don't intend to have sex with you tonight. Mm -hmm. And and she fucked him, and for not in including after play, he's a rapist. Yeah, well, for for not probably what I, I you know I don't know, but if I but had to guess, I would say that she wanted more than just a shag. She probably yeah. wanted to be his boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, um, you know. And then it didn't look like it was going to happen, you know. It sounds and, actually like. It, it actually sounds like she just is mad that he didn't spend the night. Yeah. Even, it, not even a, a relationship is mentioned. She's just mad that he didn't spend the night. And so is the Telegraph, by the way. That seems to be their angle. They're, they're going, uh, he's been accused of rape. But that's not the point. The point is he didn't do the decent thing. No, the point is he's been falsely accused of rape, dickheads. That should Boy, be I'm in trouble. <laughs> I <Yeah>. work at night. <laughs> <laughs> when you get to see your your, your partner on, on just part of second shift and then you leave, <laughs> this is what you do. You spend a little time together, you fuck like rabbits, and then you leave for work. That's what he did. He spent some time with her, they fucked like rabbits, and then he left for work. Yeah. So, yeah, pretty much. Uh, the court heard two, two days after the incident... On November 4th, last year, the complainant went to the police and Kibridge was arrested. He denies four counts, four counts of rape, one of attempted rape, assault by penetration, and sexual assault, all rising from the same incident. And the trial is yep, ongoing. See, see, they did fuck like rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we'll have to keep our eyes on this, but um, this, this, is, um, this is fucked up. That this would even like that on on this little evidence, but apparently listen and believe is what's important. The, the, and the, there's no risks to men. In fact, that she she should have been afraid. I guess I, I don't even know what they're trying to get at. And as Mike puts it, this is a ridiculous article. It looks like it was written by cheerleaders, um, or mean girls trying to screw some dude over because he didn't do Netflix and chill the way they wanted. So. Yeah, somebody in the chat just made a good point. How do you Rape somebody and also attempted rape them. Um, how, well, how you, maybe five times same? was too many. <laughs> I mean, like, maybe right, maybe the refractory period is a little longer than he had to stick around. 
I think <laughs> they must be the first two times were consensual. The third time was rape. The fourth time was attempted rape. That must be. There we go. Uh, yeah. I've deduced oh, okay. it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Is it, wait, isn't there a thing where wasn't there a discussion that feminists were having where if a man denies a woman sex, it's it's uh, abuse. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that a thing? So yeah, maybe him putting on his pants. Yeah, maybe with him putting on his pants and saying "I gotta go" is attempted uh, rape. I'm thinking that the attempted oh, wow. rape is evidence that you cannot push a chain up the street. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shooting but, and and off, honestly, bro. after four times. You know, like I said, the the, the fourth refract refractory period might have been a little longer than the other ones. It's understandable. Hey, lady, speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, all right. There's so, all types. There's all types. Yeah. <laughs> so, last thing I want to get to is um, the story about stunt men and stunt women. Uh, in brief, and then we can uh, we'll we'll end the show. So. Max is not here, unfortunately. I was hoping that we would end up getting into a discussion about it. Um, but there's an article here by The Guardian that's trying to talk about why stunt women are in more danger than stunt men. But really what it comes down to is, is that, uh, according to The Guardian, stunt women have to wear skimpier outfits because they're usually doubling for women that are wearing skimpy outfits. Uh, as in their example, they talk about The Fast and the Furious, where a, a stunt woman named Tammy Bird is wearing, like, an evening dress and she has to do stunts, and it puts her in some physical danger. But the only thing I want to say to that is that what The Guardian is really trying to make an argument uh, uh, for, um, rather, is that women are dressed too scantily in film because it's not about stunt women because they're just wearing what the women were wearing. But they're, what they're saying is that women should be wearing more because the stunt women, see, because they just get to wear, like, you know, like a high-cut evening gown or, or something, you know, of that of that nature, at least in this example, um, they can't actually, like, you know, wear a bunch of padding so they can, like, fall down and, you know, take hits and all that. But what they don't really seem to understand is a lot of times stunt men also don't get to wear padding because they might be shirtless or they might be, um, you know, in Speedos or something for any given scene. Now, typically, if there's a scene in a dinner party, where um, you have a man, a male and a female character, let's say there's a couple spies, like a James Bond film, um, the, the man will be wearing a tuxedo and the woman will be wearing an evening gown. How do you change that in order to make it safer for the stunt woman? Well, it wouldn't really make sense. Now, I'm seeing recently a resurgence to stunt work because actually for a while, and it might have been because we, we had different uh, safety codes or whatever, but in Hollywood it was actually very difficult or not, not very difficult. It was not common to see a lot of stunt work. Most of the time, they tried to get by with CGI or with um, other means, essentially without having to pay stunt people. And stunt people were not getting as much work as they used to. But if you look at films from like the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of stunt people getting a lot of work. Not only stunt people, but fight choreographers and uh, dance choreographers and so on. And a lot of times, those people were put in a good amount of danger. So when I look at this article, I'm thinking it seems like they're making a mountain out of a molehill, and, and they're, trying to draw up to, they're trying to gender a problem that is not a gendered problem because there well, are This is their MO. Yeah. This is what they do. This is their modus operandi. They, this is what they peddle in. So it's, it's not at all surprising. <laughs> no. No, they're actually going so far, I would say they're going so far as to snatch victimhood from the jaws of privilege here. Um, <laughs> Well, you think about it, and I'm going to say this every time women's clothing comes up, so you guys better get used to it. The dictates of women's clothing come from women. They do not come from men. They do not come from magazines. They do not come from television and movies. They do not come from anywhere but women. Women wear what women want to wear. And uh, we wear it to show off our assets, period. Hey. There is not some other excuse. It's not, oh, I just want to look nice. No, we want to look nice because we want people to stare at us. We want to look nice because we want that to affect the the way people treat us. We want that to make us a cut above, you know, a step above. We show off our assets because it gets us things. That is it. Yep. And women have the privilege of doing that. Men has have that privilege much less than women do. Um, in fact, the kind of dress codes, uns, unspoken, unwritten dress codes that men face, particularly in professional areas, 
uh, basically are what is being complained about here. That the male uniform, if you want to call it that, um, the, the way that men are expected to appear doesn't involve the degree of showing skin and showing assets um, that, that women are allowed to engage in. Men get in trouble for that. One way or another, men get in trouble for that. Whether it's they're considered dressing inappropriately and they're offensive to other people, you know, as, as in you came to work dressed unprofessionally, you're out of here. You, you, you cannot wear short pants to work, you, you have to wear long pants to work, um, you cannot wear a tank top, you have to wear a real shirt with sleeves, you know, is that your chest showing, oh my god, get out of here? You know, this is the kind of thing that it, women can get away with. Women can wear shorts, women can wear uh, skirts, women can wear, you know, tank tops, women can wear frilly lacy tops that show everything except their bra and not get fired not be considered unprofessional in a, in a workplace. And when a man and a woman get dressed up to go someplace really classy, the guy is covering almost all of his skin. And a woman can show up in something that shows everything that's not illegal to show. You know, and uh, that is just the way it is. And so these women's jobs as stunt women, uh, because they are working in an environment where their clothing is dictated by what is normal for women to wear anyway because they're portraying characters that are supposed to be realistic they're going to get stuck in scantier clothing and that's just the way it is it right. is absolutely not oppressive it is absolutely not discriminatory and complaining about it really is snatching victimhood from the jaws of privilege because they have the privilege of looking hot while they do their job. That's true. Allow me to make a, make something clear, though, just as an aside. The, the, the Guardian article is trying to make the stunt women and the victims of sexism. But the stunt women themselves are not complaining. The stunt well, women difficult. themselves, in, the, in, their, in their interviews, are saying, this is the job that I have chosen, therefore, this is what I have to do. It can be hard, and sometimes I get hurt but the men get hurt too and more often they get hurt far worse. So yeah. and I can imagine the men get hurt worse simply because and this is another uh, real life thing in real life men take more risks in real life men do things that are more likely to hurt them or get them hurt in their jobs and and in other aspects of their lives and so a stunt man is going to be more likely to have to portray an, an event or an activity that's likely to get him hurt than a stunt woman, even in action movies. Yeah, I would assume stunt people would consider it a badge of honor to be taking a risk. If you tell a stunt yeah. woman, "Hey, did you know your job is really dangerous?" They'd be like, "Yeah, good. I like <laughs> danger. I'm a fucking stunt woman." <laughs> By the way, <laughs> so, like... you mean I have it more dangerous than men? Shit, that I'm doing my job better than men. It's kind of like uh, bitching that you know maybe maybe uh, doctors treat more people than nurses you know, and 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 saying well because the nurses treat people differently they do a different thing they're not they're not practicing medicine like doctors are, you know that you know they're victims or doctors because they they have to prescribe medicine and nurses don't they're victims you know no it's just the nature of the job. Mm -hmm. By the way, um, stunt women actually get paid the same as stunt men but men have to the stunt men actually do more dangerous stuff for the same pay now it's not a complaint because I think that in general um, there are more stunt men so therefore the demand for stunt men is lower than the demand for stunt women there's fewer of them and like I said before they don't usually complain um, n neither of them, you know, stunt men or stunt women, because they know what they're getting into when they go into it, and it's usually because they tend to be adrenaline junkies that like this stuff. On top of that, it's also important to point out that when you're uh, the one thing that um, the guardians probably highly likely not taking into consideration is that there are a lot of stunt men that are actually the actors themselves that do their own stunts. For example, um, Tom Cruise, who is I believe is in his 50s now, say whatever you want about him. But the guy does his own stunts whenever he can. So when you saw the, the newest Mission Impossible movie, and he's like hanging out the side of the airplane as it's taking off, that's oh, not yeah, an that's effect. Right. That's Tom Cruise hanging onto his side. I mean, granted, there are wires and shit, but 
he was hanging out to the side of that airplane. Yeah, and apparently and, they had to do it like five times, too, to get the shot. Yeah. So it's not, it's not only did he do it, but he did it again and again and again and again and again. Yeah, and there are a lot of people that, you know, would do most of their own stunts. Uh, uh, actors, you know, and, and, like, to take it up to another level, some of the people who I admire the most are the Hong Kong action stars. Um, uh, and, I, you know, they're the usual, um, you know, uh, suspects like uh, Jackie Chan and Sammo Hung, but there are also female action stars that do all their own stunts, and they're often very talented and resilient individuals. One of my all-time favorites, and if you guys don't know who she is, you should definitely look her up. Her name is Yukari Oshima. She's from Okinawa, and she did a lot of kung fu movies in the 80s. Um, and she did all of her own stunts. And in an interview, uh, it was an extended interview where she talked about her work, she said, oh, you know, she would take, because sometimes the martial arts movies, when the choreography was, like, at its height, the, the, the hits were real. Like, these weren't, like, you know, these sort of, like, Hollywood movies where you throw the punch and it's like right. they, they just film the camera at an angle that it looks like it connects but it's way you know there, there's like a big gap between where the fist is at and where the face is at these people get hit, dust comes off their faces, they get in the chest, they get in the face and everything and Yukari Shimi used to take hits all the time and you know Michelle Yeoh would like hang from uh, you know the sides of buses and shit and they, all, <laughs> they got injured often you know like and they would talk about it, Jackie Chan's broken so many bones you know, like, and he just like gets to the point now where he dislocates a finger and he just pops it back in because this is just the job. And these people are not just stunt people; they're they're stunt people, they're actors, they're martial artists, they're singers, they're dancers. They do the whole thing. So, and I think that a lot of people who do stunt work professionally they admire that a great deal. And for the Guardian to try to take these women that take this job very seriously and trivialize it, it's, it should be insulting to them. I hope that they saw that, and, and they pro what probably happened is they were interviewed, and they thought, oh, that was nice. They, they wanted to talk to me about my job, and then they read it, and they're like, holy shit, they're making me out to a victim of sexism in the industry when I get paid as much as this guy, but he does riskier shit than I do. You know what? And that, brings up, that brings up an interesting idea. Maybe we should contact uh, the woman from the article and talk to her. Yeah. Well, if a Tammy, I don't know if that's viable. Tammy Baird but... is one. I don't know. It would be hard to do. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, it's worth a shot. You Tammy Baird, and then there's the woman who, uh, Dana Grant, who was Charlize Theron's double in Mad Max. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these these people, they, they it's a dangerous job, and they get paid well to do it. And I don't think it should be trivialized or, you know, they should be called sexist for whatever reason. That's ridiculous. So, but, but yeah. Um, guys, if you know who of any, like, badass, like... Uh, uh, women that do their own stunts or or uh, do Hong Kong action. That that's where you're going to see a lot of that. Um, you know, leave a comment. I want to know if you guys know who Yukari Yoshima is. Bonus points for that. Uh, she's the shit. I mean, I just I, and she's gorgeous too, or was. I mean, she's old now, so. <laughs> um. <laughs> Real hard uh, put up wet, as they say. Well, I mean, you know, she's still Asian, so it's not like. <laughs> She, she hasn't hit Raisin State yet? No, no. <laughs> oh, God. All right. So, anyway, um, I guess we're going to wrap it up here. We uh, Unless one of you guys had a thought about the rich wise being told to get a job as judges clamp down on meal ticket divorces. I um, want to say, yeah, I mean, I'm glad, uh, that, you know, that that's happening. It's, it's, it's a shame that, uh, you know, because when you're like, if you're a 50-year-old woman and you were used to essentially everything being paid for, and all of a sudden you come, you you know, you go to your divorce, you're expecting to be taken care of for the rest of your life, and all of a sudden the judge is like, you better go get a job because your kids are in school and this guy should not have to pay for you for the rest of your life. Um, I, I'm sure that's going to be tough on them. They probably don't have much in the way of life skills, or at least, I mean not like life skills, but rather um, skills that they could job bring projects. to a business. Yeah, like job job skills. And, and that's got to be tough, but, uh, you know, this is the reality. You know, I mean... This is a uh, to put that burden on on husbands is ridiculous. So you know, uh, I, I included a link to the article in um, on the show notes page if you guys want to read it. Uh, but basically, you know, the, this is a growing trend. Divorce lawyers are are like, the, you know, things aren't the meal ticket thing is not working out as often as it used to. Judges are getting wise to it. Hopefully. This will be something that continues and doesn't just affect the super rich, because right now it's with rich people, but rather, 
you know, of the middle class and, and on down. Because, uh, you know, if we're going to have this rate of divorce at this height, then these um, people who are just sort of like expecting to um, be taken care of for the rest of their life because they decide to marry someone that's, that was willing to provide for their family and then, then turn around and try to divorce them and then try to live off of that money for the rest of their life, they should uh, face that harsh reality of trying to like, you know, actually survive on their own. Because that is what they've decided to do when they got a divorce. So, but uh, let me see. I think we're gonna close it out. Oh, Hannah, you got one thing to say. Please go. Yeah, I got one thing to say about this. Um, the only people that get that that concession are women who claim to be handicapped because of having sacrificed their, you know, they call it, they consider it a sacrifice to to raise their children. Uh, what that's basically doing is, yet again, snatching victimhood from the jaws of privilege. You know, there was nobody in the world who was going to cry for me when I had to work three jobs to support my family because the government was taking a huge chunk of the income out of my house and handing it to a woman who, be, who didn't want to uh, do a job to support hers. Um, and I have no sympathy for women who take 30 years not working and then divorce their husbands. And this is something that, you know, most divorce is initiated by women, something like 70%. Um, most divorce is uh, not only initiated by women, but initiated due to things more like boredom and the, the falsehood of irreconcilable differences. And when I say falsehood, I say that usually, I say that because it usually results from one party or the other in the marriage not being willing to work and it's usually the woman because she feels like the man should be working to make the relationship continue and she doesn't have to and you'll see that with um, with uh, marriage counseling in spades a marriage counselors job is to tell a man what he's doing wrong so he can make his wife happy um, it's it's not an equal thing at all so women are really really pampered in a marriage a marriage is a really cushy situation for a woman it's not like that for a man. So uh, when women just abandon it like that, I don't think they deserve sympathy for ha having to reduce their standard of living and maybe go work at a gas station like I worked at a gas station for six years for an abusive boss. You know, not the whole time. I didn't have an abusive boss the whole time. Um, I actually went through six managers at that gas station. But, uh, but yeah... It is absolutely another example of snatching victimhood for the, from the jaws of privilege and all for the sake of trying to get out of doing what women in the lower financial classes have to live with all the time. Yeah. Well, thanks, Anna, for that. Um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show. I want to thank Mike, Scott... Hannah and Max for joining me on the Polecat cast today. And uh, for those of you guys who are watching, please leave a comment related to any of the stories that we um, touched on. And uh, yeah, because I like to read them. We will uh, talk to you guys next time on the Polecat. Thank you.